In this second part of a three-part series on Doctor Who, the Daleks and Ethics, we look at deontological ethics and ask whether the deontologist can exterminate the Daleks on The Sci-Fi Show. <laughs> Last time we looked at the question of virtue ethics, and whether it was permissible for the Doctor, as virtue ethicist, to commit genocide and rid the universe of the scourge of the Daleks. Not an easy decision for the virtue ethicist to make. This time we'll consider a second school of thought, that of the deontologist. The word deontology comes from the Greek word deon, which means duty, and logos, which in this context means study of. This is a fitting name because, at its heart, Deontological theories of ethics are rooted in moral obligations that a person has a binding duty to honour. There are a number of schools of deontological ethics, but I'll touch on two of the larger ideas, the categorical imperative of Enlightenment thinker Immanuel Kant and divine command theory. Unlike virtue ethics, deontological ethics aim at keeping a binding set of rules, and what is important as an overriding concern is the right motive for an act. This distinguishes it from the other modern ethical framework, consequentialism, that determines the rightness or wrongness of an act depending on its consequences. Deontology can care about the results of an act, but they're generally a secondary concern if they rate as concern at all. What matters is an act founded in duty and done because it is the right act in a given circumstance. What matters is the motive for the action. <laughs> This is unusual because it seems that there are three facets to any moral act. The motive, the act itself, and the consequences. The consequentialist likewise reduced morality to one of these three concerns, instead of considering all three. So how does the deontologist determine this set of right and wrong acts? Interestingly, the two schools we'll look at, although similar on the surface, arrive at radically different answers to this question. Immanuel Kant faced a dilemma in ethics, and he was confronted with the question of whether ethics could be a scientific enterprise. He thought it could, and he formulated two variations of the categorical imperative to create a foundation for ethical behaviour. The first formulation of the categorical imperative, act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it becomes a universal law, is quite interesting. Kant thinks he can derive all of ethics from this principle. One thing to note, it's empty of context. This formulation of the categorical imperative is a purely formal rule. It has antecedents in moral thought. The most obvious of these is the golden rule, either in its negative, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you, or the positive formulation, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This does seem like it might be a workable foundation for morality, although it has a few problems. But first, let's consider what works about it. The categorical imperative does make sense of why some actions are morally bad. If I lie or steal from you, then I'm trying to do something that couldn't work or be effective as a universal rule. I could not will that everybody act in this fashion, especially lying. For me to be able to lie to you requires that you think I have some general obligation to be truthful to you. If lying were the rule, it wouldn't be useful. Being truthful by comparison as a universal rule is useful. So I think the categorical imperative is right in seeing that Moral wrongdoing is where we are carving out exceptions to moral rules to suit and advantage ourselves. Although this does reduce being moral to being logically consistent. There is a problem with this formulation though. It can't make sense of acts of what is known as super erogation. Super erogatory acts are acts that go above and beyond the call of duty, and these are normally regarded as especially morally praiseworthy acts but they are by definition acts that go above and beyond what is expected morally from people. But the categorical imperative would either command that supererogatory acts are obligatory for all, which is impossibly burdensome, or that such acts have no or negative moral worth. It seems like a strange conclusion to reach. That it's wrong to make moral exceptions for yourself in the direction of acts that are better than what duty demands. So it seems to fall short here and run counter to our moral intuitions. There are another couple of problems that seem difficult to resolve as well. The first of these is that the imperative as formulated is empty of any content. 
What if everybody willed as a moral law that it was okay to torture animals? Or that the best life is one lived in a perpetual drunken stupor? You might object, but nobody would will that. Although it seems that some people might, and it seems logically possible that such things could be willed. How do we make sense of the idea that these are not proper things to will? Another problem, and I think a more significant one, is that it runs counter to some fairly deep moral intuitions that we have. Is duty really all there is to morality? Is that really the only valid motive for doing a moral act? It would seem that duty isn't the primary motivation, but the final defense against doing the wrong thing. Do your duty is an encouragement given to troops as they are scared in the tenth hour of the bombardment, and their courage has fled them. Keeping a marriage vow because it's your duty too is the final bulwark when you already are strongly tempted and have started to give in to the desire for infidelity. Seems like a poor foundation to build upon. Also consider the following. If my wife asked me, Why do you stay with me? Which is the better answer? Because I love you, or because I have a binding moral duty according to the categorical imperative? A final problem is it can't really make sense of an observation about a profound moral difference between saints and sinners. Saints should be understood as a deeply morally virtuous person, a person who by habit tends to do the good, while a sinner should be understood as someone who is generally morally corrupt and have difficulty doing the right thing. What we observe is that saints enjoy doing the right thing, that they derive enjoyment and pleasure from good acts, while sinners feel pain and discomfort from doing morally good acts. It does recognize that choosing the right action is easier and more rewarding for a person who makes a habit of it, but it would seem to rob that act of value as it ceases to be motivated simply by duty. The philosopher Peter Kreeft told a story to illustrate this idea. St. Francis of Assisi and Bluebeard, the pirate, are walking together in Rome when there is an earthquake and a bank vault breaks open and spills gold coins into the street. For St. Francis, with his accustomed vow of poverty, the gold is no temptation at all. The saint can pass up the opportunity for theft with no difficulty and even enjoys the opportunity. But Bluebeard is tempted to steal the gold he sees. But this time Bluebeard decides not to steal the gold. That for the first time in his life, he'll choose the right action and leave the gold where it is. Who's the better man? According to the imperative, Bluebeard is acting from duty, even though it causes him emotional turmoil to pass up the gold. Francis is acting from habit. In this instant, is Bluebeard really the more moral of the two? It seems a strange conclusion, but if duty is the only motivator, then it would seem to follow. There is another formulation of the categorical imperative that is different to the first and isn't purely formal. It says, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always, at the same time, as an end. In short, don't use people instrumentally, the way you would use an object, but treat them as an end in themselves. This formulation is less purely formal, it makes reference to other people specifically, and differentiates them from mere objects. I'm not sure the reformulation adds much, although it's probably clearer in intent. There's a third formulation. Therefore, every rational being must so act as if he were thought his maxim always a legislating member in the universal kingdom of the ends. Although this isn't substantially different to the second version, it's a bit more general and would cover the case of sentient aliens which might prove useful when you consider the Daleks. The other large branch of deontological ethics is called divine command theory, and it finds the basis for ethics in a defined set of moral laws that are binding on human beings. The difference from Kant's categorical imperative is that the laws are, as the name suggests, commands from God. The outworking of this idea is similar. God commands a set of moral principles, and these are binding obligations for humans as a result. The most significant difference between divine command theory and the categorical imperative is that it is heteronymous, whereas Kant's idea is autonomous. The list of rules comes from outside, rather than being the product of the self's reason. One of the implications of this difference is quite significant. It means that in divine command theory, men are subject to God's command. But in Kant's ethical framework, men are effectively little gods themselves, setting out the rules in line with the categorical imperative. Although on the surface they're similar frameworks, underneath they're as different as can be. There are a number of criticisms of divine command theory, and it's subject to some of the same criticisms as Kant's theory. 
but probably the most significant of these criticisms is known as the Euthyphro Dilemma put forward by Plato. The Euthyphro Dilemma asks the question, do the gods command the good, or does the gods command make the good? Essentially, what Plato was getting at is the idea that either the good is something external to the gods, that the gods are not required for the good, or else the good as decreed by the gods is essentially arbitrary. There are a number of different attempts to address the Euthyphro Dilemma, and they'll feature in a future podcast. So where does all this leave the Doctor? If the Doctor was subject to the commands of some particular deity, then just checking the deity's opinion on the Daleks would make the decision to eliminate them quite simple. However, the Time Lords appear to have no gods as such, so that avenue will be closed to us. It would seem that we are only left with the categorical imperative to go on. At first glance, it's difficult to see how the categorical imperative could allow for the genocide of the Daleks. You could never reasonably claim that the elimination of a sentient species was a binding moral command that could be willed as a universal rule for all other sentient beings. One possible way to deal with the issue is to assume that the Daleks have placed themselves outside the members of the Universal Kingdom of Ends, that they don't qualify as humanity in a suitably broad sense. After all, they're bent on exterminating everyone not like themselves, so a case could probably be made that they've forfeited the right to be considered part of the relevant community. Alternatively, perhaps, you could argue that you are just doing what the Daleks want and enacting their maxim for them by exterminating them. I suppose this might be a rhetorical trick, though. Perhaps deontology of the Kantian variety can't really help us with this situation. It's one of the ethical corner cases, and a hard and fast rule may not be able to deal with that. So, does deontology work for you? I'm firmly in the virtue ethics camp myself, but the concrete rules of deontology do have a certain simple ethical appeal. It's easy to follow a set of rules once you understand them, and many people in my religious tradition, the Christian one, have subscribed to variations on the Divine Command Theory theme. You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com, and I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com. You can also leave a comment in the show notes on scifishow.com, and you can also leave a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash sci-fi show. Please, if you're on Facebook, give us a like. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's Fi with a PH. Let me know what you think. The Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license, and the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. 